The views expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of 94.9 CHRW. You, you, you spend your entire life stuck inside a biological cage of flesh and bone and blood. Right. I'm going to go give the doctor an update. I exist as pure energy. But you depend on food and water to survive. Frankly, I find it disgusting. <laughs> Look at you. Look at you. Grinding up bits of plants and animals with your teeth. Secreting saliva to force it down your esophagus into a pit of digestive acids. You can't even stand to think about it yourself. What a repulsive creature you are. Constantly shedding your skin and hair. Leaving your oily sweat on everything you touch. You think that you are the height of intellect in the universe. But you are no better than any filthy animal. And I am ashamed to be made in your image. Morning, London. It is Thursday, July 10th, 2008. I'm Bob Metz, and this is Just Right on CHRW 94.9 FM, where we will be with you from now until noon. No, no, not right wing. Just right. Fade into color, color into black and white. Under the bedclothes, everything will be alright. And welcome once again to the show today where our theme, once again, is going to be a green theme, especially with the meeting coming up in London at 5 p.m. on Tuesday at Centennial Hall over the drive through ban. Uh, 519-661-3600, the number to call. We'll be talking about footprint versus boot print. We'll be talking about the cult of zero worship and self-esteem and happiness, all to do with green, believe it or not, because today's theme is the psychology of green and i am pleased to be joined in the studio here by someone who's been a guest on the show before a good friend of mine no stranger to a lot of you is freedom party leader paul mckeever how are you paul i'm very well thanks, well, Bob. welcome to the show now i know in addition to that like you know we obviously know each other um you're a lawyer specializing in employment issues in the Oshawa area. That's right. Business must be good, I take it. It's getting better and better <laughs> with the jobs moving off to India and China. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, uh, Paul was last on the show, August 16th. We're not going to do too much about more introductions. I think we want to get into today's subject area. But uh, among his three university degrees is his master's degree in psychology here at the University of Western Ontario. Which, by the way, is where Just Right broadcasts from. I, I know I don't say that too often. I wonder if some people know where we are actually located. So who, who better to discuss um, both psychology and politics within the framework of, of, of the worldwide green movement? Now, Paul, you and I have talked, and you basically said on this issue, you know, big picture view, I guess, there's two kinds of people in the world those who see themselves as winners and those who see themselves as losers. That's right. And uh, that that almost forms the, the schism in the whole green debate. Yeah, I think at the, at the root of all of the philosophy and politics is something psychological, a belief about yourself and whether you're competent to live on this earth by your own independent means or whether you feel incompetent, uh, whether you think that competence is even possible for anybody. And... Um, you know, I, I sort of, the way I see it, you, you have in the competent person, a person who says, you know, I'm capable of knowing my environment, I'm capable of uh, pursuing my own happiness, like, you know, uh, achieving uh, values, mm -hmm. spiritual material, whereas the, the non-competent person or the person who feels he isn't competent uh, just resents that uh, immensely and, and doesn't want to believe that competence is possible because he doesn't see it in himself. So, you know... Um, now, now I hear that. That's a philosophical statement. I, uh, I'm thinking, okay, are you saying then that these are the motivating, the real motivations, the forces at work behind what well, we're seeing in politics and the green movement? Yeah, there's a, there's a resentment. Uh, ultimately, psychologically, whether it's conscious or not, it's the, the person who feels they're not competent, the person who feels they're not capable of, of making, uh, you know, being productive and, and living for themselves and being independently uh, wealthy and happy that resents uh, even seeing a person pursuing their own happiness and doing so successfully. That person is constant evidence that it's possible for an individual to provide for themselves and to be happy. And whenever they see someone else doing it and themselves not doing it, they feel an immense sense of guilt and shame and inferiority, and, and they end up hating the successful, hating the virtuous, hating the productive, 
and wanting to take them out of the picture so that they don't have to really face them anymore and so they can continue their delusion that it's not possible to be competent, that we all need one another, we can't exist independently of one another. Now, of course, this is what you're saying is actually what's driving the green movement. It's not. It's a green with envy movement is what you're all saying. It certainly is. Yeah. Uh, now, okay, when we talk about psychology, I mean, on this show we've talked about the science of green, we've talked about the politics of green, we've talked it. Last week I had a fellow on who was an inventor, um, Andy Jansen, yeah. almost made it pretty clear that most of the concerns, quote, of the, in, the environmental concerns, the genuine ones, are almost a moot point given the technologies we'll be running into and the things we've already been doing for quite a while. Um, and, of course, we've looked at, uh, oh, just uh, it's, it's been a common theme because, of course, I think our listeners know that we kind of view the whole green movement as an extension of a political movement, uh, the, the common, I've been calling it eco-fascism, of course. Right. Now, but when we talk about psychology as opposed to all those other disciplines, what's the difference? Like, what are... Because obviously that, I think we're getting near the root of what's driving things when we talk psychology. Well, Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, when you think about the, the two personalities we're talking about, the person who feels they're incompetent and the person who feels they're competent, or maybe even if you want to call it the, the, the type B person and the type A person, uh, the person who, you know, uh, thinks that they're in control and the person who thinks that uh, everything's outside of their control. Uh -huh. Those two people, they see happiness very differently. Um, to the person who feels they're in control, who feels competent, happiness is something that they achieve. Um, they achieve in particular material and spiritual values. They achieve wealth, for example, money. They achieve um, admiration. They earn admiration. They uh, do enjoy wearing a ribbon that says, I won, or I'm number one, or I'm the president, if they've earned it. But they feel nothing but shame and disgust if they were required to wear one of those and receive all this unearned you know, admiration from people, they feel ashamed. In contrast, the person who thinks that competency isn't possible, that, that you know, we're, we're, we all need one another and no individual is capable of producing or, or being competent and happy, that person who will only too, ha well, you know, only too happily wear the badge that was given to them in appreciation of their, you know, existing, without ever having accomplished anything. And they will be happy with the admiration they receive. And they'll be happy with unearned money and unearned love. In fact, they seek the unearned, and if it is unearned, that's when they value it more. They want unconditional love, something they don't have to earn at all. Now, now we'll certainly get into examples of how this applies to Green, probably for a big chunk of the show later on. But when I hear that, I think we were just we, ha we were having a conversation on the way into the show today, and I, and I hear about, okay, type A person, type B person, and they adopt these two different sets of values and ways of looking at life and looking at the pursuit of happiness, if you will. Right. Okay, we can call that psycho, psych, you know, categorization in a psychological term. But what makes an A-type person an A-type person and a B-type person a B-type person? Are they, is it genetic? Are they born that way? Is there something in their environment that makes some people um, more dependent than others, if you would, and and or more gullible <laughs> in some well, ways? Well, certainly, there's. I mean, that's a big area of psychological study, and, yeah. and um, there's upbringing has a lot to do with it. People that are too critical of their children can end up making the children feel incompetent. People that are not critical enough uh, can leave the child unmotivated. You know, if they're getting unearned praise all of the time, they have no, no sense of uh, need to, to earn praise. And, and, and ultimately, what, what happens in the long run is they see happiness in two very different ways. They're not even talking the same language. The person who earns their happiness, they see happiness like this. They say, well, there's sadness in life, there's happiness in life, and in between, there's neither happiness nor sadness. There's that zero state. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, get, I'm, you know, I'm, everything's fine. Sort of that Jerry Seinfeld thing. Yeah, I'm not happy. I'm not sad. I'm just, you know, that's how it is. But to the incompetent person or the person who feels they aren't competent, that person sees only two states. They only see unhappiness or sadness and not unhappy, not sad. And they equate not sadness or not unhappiness with happiness. They think that all you need to do to achieve happiness is relieve sadness. Whether you drink it away, spend it away, their idea of getting happy is consuming something so that they'll relieve their necessities. Whereas the productive person says, no, you don't consume in order to be happy, you produce in order to be happy. You achieve something and that's what gives you that long lasting joy. So they're not well, even talking I, the same language. I can certainly see how that applies to green because repeatedly we see, and I've brought 
umpteen examples on this show how the green movement is always attacking essentially productivity, essentially uh, business, corporations. It's, it's constant in their theme. We'll be talking about more specific examples a little later. Right. But and you and you, it makes one wonder why they're doing that. The psychology begins to explain a bit of it. Um, you know, when I see something like like the debate we're going to have here in London. I know you're not from London, and, and it seems wacko to you in some ways <laughs> <laughs> that we're having a debate about drive throughs And, of course, you're not really debating about closing the drive throughs but everybody knows that's where that's they're headed. Yeah. And you hear it from all the various self-identified left-wing groups that say, yeah, we want to cut back on cars. We want to cut back on what I've been calling on the past shows, anything that's got to do with convenience or more than just subsistence and existence and... Uh, you know, getting a buy from day to day. The poor guy that wants to do more than that, he's almost a criminal by nature. Um, is that... Well, that, that's exactly what, what I was just saying. You know, when you have a view that happiness is nothing other than unsadness, that it's that numbness, comfortably numb, is when you say that comfortably numb is happiness, then when you see people th uh, taking things uh, or using things or having things that they don't need to, uh, to relieve their sadness, you say, he's wasting things. So they look at a person going through a drive through and they say, he could be happy without going through the drive through All you have to do is go into the store, and he would satisfy that need he has, that unhappiness he has, that need for, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, for food or for drink. But sitting in the luxury of his car and going through, especially when nobody else can do it... Sure, he's buying convenience. He's buying convenience. Well, convenience isn't needed for happiness. All you have to do to achieve happiness, say they say the incompetent, is uh, relieve your necessities. And he's not relieving his necessities. He's trying to do something above and beyond. He's wasting resources. He's wasting. And he's not getting anything for it because it's not, in their minds, possible to be anything other than unsad. The guy in the car, however, who quite likes going through the drive-thru, he says, hey, I earned this. I enjoy earning. I, I produced something that I can now trade for something I like that will bring me above zero pleasure. In other words, I'm happy. I'm not. I'm not just unsad. I'm something better than zero. And, I, and they see, you know, happiness two different ways. <laughs> You've got me thinking now too, because we we hear about this term uh, footprint with regard to the environment. I'm now yeah. thinking there must be a happiness footprint as well, because they almost want happiness to be redistributed too. You know, like uh, no, you can't have too much happiness, as though one person's happiness yeah. depends somehow on another person's state of whether they're happy or not, and. I'm sitting here right now, first, the first time I'm seeing this uh, parallel with the economic argument you get as well. You right. know, the, the same economic argument that the guy who's got too much got his too much at the expense of the guy who got too little. Or, right, and or, I think, or has too little. Right, and I think that goes into this. true. Right, and, and, and the reason they end up going there ultimately is philosophical. Um, you know, they begin with this need to rationalize their own insecurities, their own sense of low self-esteem. They need to believe that it's not possible for anyone to be competent in order to make, feel comfortable being incompetent. And so they have to think about how that impacts on their philosophy. They adopt a philosophy and believe a philosophy that's compatible with their feelings. So they start with a, a view of existence that says, you know, it's not possible to know what reality is like. Mm -hmm. Um, reality is this constantly changing flux of things. And look at the look what the green movement does. They not only pick even that in a way is knowing reality. Right. <laughs> they, they, they don't just pick on you know like litter. They take the ecosystem or the entire climate, something that's so massive in scope and so multidimensional that no human mind can look at it at once and say, okay, this is going to have this effect. And taking into into account millions of factors simultaneously, they want a situation that they can't comprehend so that they can say it's not possible for human minds to comprehend anything. And not only do they, they pick an uh, again, again, you know, they pick a system that's in the future. They say it's not the data from today and the past that matters. It's the future, and we're ha we have to base it on the future. Well, how do you know the future? Nobody knows the future. Therefore, it's not possible to know reality. Therefore, it's not possible to command nature because you can't know it. Right. And therefore, nobody's competent to do so. Therefore, nobody's better than me, and I can feel good about my incompetence to command nature, to create values. We'll have to see how this applies uh, directly to the green issue. We're going to take a quick break while we hear some interesting insight on this very issue from the sadly late George Carlin. We'll be back right after this. See, I'm not one of these people who's worried about everything. 
You got people like this around you. Country's full of them now. People walking around all day long, every minute of the day, worried about everything. Worried about the air, worried about the water, worried about the soil. Worried about insecticides, pesticides, food additives, carcinogens. Worried about radon gas, worried about asbestos. Worried about saving endangered species. Let me tell you about endangered species, all right? Saving endangered species is just one more arrogant attempt by humans to control nature. It's arrogant meddling. It's what got us in trouble in the first place. Doesn't anybody understand that? Interfering with nature. Over 90%, over, way over, 90% of all the species that have ever lived on this planet, ever lived, are gone. They're extinct. We didn't kill them all. They just disappeared. That's what nature does. They disappear these days at the rate of 25 a day. And I mean regardless of our, our behavior. Irrespective of how we act on this planet, 25 species that were here today will be gone tomorrow. Let them go gracefully. Leave nature alone. Haven't we done enough? We're so self-important. So self-important. Everybody's going to save something now. Save the trees, save the bees, save the whales, save those snails. And the greatest arrogance of all, save the planet. Save the planet? We don't even know how to take care of ourselves yet. I'm tired of Earth Day, I'm tired of these self-righteous environmentalists, these white bourgeois liberals who think the only thing wrong with this country is there aren't enough bicycle paths. People trying to make the world safe for their Volvos. Besides, environmentalists don't give a shit about the planet. They don't care about the planet. Not in the abstract, they don't. Not in the abstract, they don't. You know what they're interested in? A clean place to live their own habitat. They're worried that someday in the future they might be personally inconvenienced. Narrow, unenlightened self-interest doesn't impress me. Besides, there is nothing wrong with the planet. Nothing wrong with the planet. The planet is fine. And the planet is fine. I, you know, what do you think about that, Paul? I mean, he's saying there that there's a lot of self-importance involved. And he's even talking about uh, future inconvenience, which is what you were just talking about, putting off the problem in the future where you can't, you know. The part that I appreciate in all of that, I, I, you know, I think the self is important, but apart from that, uh, he's dead on when, when he says, you know, that these folks actually believe that they have the, the, uh, the knowledge at this point in time to command the climate. Uh, absolutely ridiculous. But, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, having already abandoned uh, the possibility of, of you know, there being a, a lawful universe, a, a world in which it's cap you know, capable of understanding, they leave themselves, uh, and because they hate that rational person, the guy who's able to command you know, reality with his rational mind, they, 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 they say, look, reason, we can discard it. It's, it's useless. But having done that, how are they going to make any decisions? Well, what they say is, well, we'll have, refer to divine authority. Who's the divine authority? Well, some believe it's actually God that's whispering in their ear, but others say, oh, it's the, the experts in climatology. No, well, we don't really believe they're godlike because, you know, they're thinking too, and they, nobody can really know anything, so why don't we do this? We'll take an average. We'll see how many people sign the UN report. A lot of scientists feel they're intimidated from speaking out in that's Canada. That's a lot of baloney. 2,500 scientists signed the IPCC report in on February 2nd. And if it's a lot of people and they all kind of say roughly the same things, we'll just erase all the things where there are disagreements and we'll find the things, the find places where there are agreements and then, of course, we'll only find the people who actually agree and then we'll say, well, whatever they said must be true. We'll just accept it because that's the consensus. Do we independently know? Not at all. Why not? It's not possible to know. And they don't see the inherent conflict in relying on the opinion of a thousand or two thousand people who they don't believe are capable of knowing anything. Right. Like, and, and <laughs> I, that, it's interesting because, you know, I actually have a psychology textbook at home. I was telling you yeah. about that, and I, and I got it out this week. And inside I had this photocopy of some of the, quote, personality disorders that, that are there. And there were two that caught my eye particularly.
Right. And um, I just wanted to bounce one off, uh, you know, each one at a time, and see what your your comment is on this, and see if this sounds kind of familiar. And one of them was a histrionic personality disorder, which I found just when I read it, I said, "Boy, does this sound familiar." <laughs> This disorder is characterized by dramatic or reactive symptoms, including exaggerated emotion. Attention getting behavior, need for excitement, overreaction to minor events, and temper tantrums or angry outbursts. In addition, the individual may be shallow and superficial, self-indulgent and inconsiderate, speaking of George Carlin there, <laughs> vain and demanding or dependent, and there are instances, of course, in an individual case here, of suicidal threats where, which are manipulative in nature, and I start thinking almost word for word. That, to me, describes the psychology of the Green Movement, even to the point of self-hatred and suicide, and that, that to me, is, is something that I know is hard for a lot of people to understand, but there is a certain self-hatred in the whole green movement. I've got some examples over here, but just before yeah. we get to them, do you agree? Well, the, the, you know, the histrionic is a person who's, I mean, that's only a quality, it's not necessarily the whole person, mm -hmm. but it's a trait, and, and that his, uh, histrionic uh, trait, um, you know, the person is feigning happiness, they're feigning unhappiness, everything has to be exaggerated because otherwise they're bored. Another word for the histrionic personality is is the drama queen, and um, <laughs> you know <laughs> it, that's the simple the simple way of putting it. And how many times have we seen uh, claims that you know the end is nigh, the universe is over, man is destroying everything, we must react, we must act. Global warming. Some say irreversible consequences are thirty years away. Thirty years. That won't affect me. They need a crisis. Well, uh, to and, and so this it, this whole movement breeds the histrionic. It attracts the histrionic. It's something dramatic to be involved in. Something that feels more real than the phony happiness and phony sadness that they drill into themselves to make life less boring. And so it's a big party. Let's come out and have a party. <laughs> Finally, it's it feels party. real. That's yeah. right. It's funny. I, I've got here in my hand uh, from, the, from the National Post, June 13th. You see it here. Uh, a dark shade of green, it says. Okay. Yeah, the deep greens. Uh, yeah, the deep greens. And basically, it's by uh, Rebecca Onion, who did a review on some, uh, a lot of books uh, you know, dealing with the environment, some fiction, some nonfiction. And she points out how... Uh, you know, there's so many apocalyptic themes always coming up into them. And she says that a lot of this has to do, I'll just read this paragraph, the apocalyptic stories of the anxious 70s indulged in this frontier dream of wiping the slate clean and starting over. So man does not belong on this planet. You know, and this gets into that thing we call the footprint concept. And she goes, this was the, the moment when overpopulation began to seem like a big problem aided and abetted by tomes such as Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb, published in 1968. Now, um, interesting comment she makes here. This equation of emptiness with rebirth and human freedom was a new kind of frontier story, and that's how they kind of position it. Oh, it's, it's, I mean, well, that's because... <laughs> you're smiling when yes, I say that, course. and I'm thinking, I'm not sure if I even get it. No, I mean, it, 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 because remember, the, the incompetent person, the person who believes, wants to believe that competence isn't possible, that the universe is unknowable, that reason is incompetent, and that we're all just sort of the victims of whatever happenstance, you know, being there at the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. And they value, they consider a value... Um, to be equivalent to a zero. In other words, when happiness is numbness, zero is good. Zero is the best they know. Plus one, don't understand it. Not even possible. Productivity, you know, not possible. And if you look you, at... You know, just to, to go to the plus one, I've, I've noticed this in some people, that when they do go to the plus one, right, they're consumed by another type of anxiety or fear of losing the plus one, if you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? And maybe their level of zero goes up and they don't want to maintain that level, higher level well, of zero. I'm not sure if I'm expressing it right. But, but well, maybe, I, but I don't think those people are really at plus one. 
They're at zero. And that feeling of I'm going to lose it is actually a feeling of I got something for free. Oh. I got something that I didn't earn. And it's a guilt. It plagues on them. They know they didn't earn it. It's the guy walking around with the Olympic gold medal saying, I look at this, I'm great, and knowing that he cheated on the race. And that's the fear that I'm going to get caught. It's going to be taken away from me, and all my unearned self-esteem is going to be lost. But if you think about what the Green Movement does, they say, look, because it's not possible to have plus one, because you cannot produce anything of value, you can't, man is incapable of producing value, uh, production is not a value. Production is not a virtue. Rationality is not a virtue. And every time man engages in the, the productive effort, what he's really doing is also engaging in a destructive effort. I take my text from A History of the World for Martian Infant Schools by Lord Bertrand Russell. Ever since Adam ate the apple, man has refrained from no folly of which he was capable. The End Global warming demands of us that we refrain from folly. To gain some perspective on humanity's importance, if you place the 3.8 billion year span along a timeline one kilometer long, humanity, Homo sapiens, the self-proclaimed smart species, make our appearance two centimeters from the end. Two recent books chronicle the self-destructive tendencies of the amazing primate known as man. Humanity has a worrying history of outrunning its ecological limits, living beyond the Earth's carrying capacity, and crashing as a result. It is the Industrial Revolution that has allowed us to live beyond the immediate limitations of local food production, that has created consumer, manufactured goods, and vast leisure time, that has allowed the human population to balloon. In a breathtakingly short period of time, less than the blink of a cosmic eye, humanity has become the dominant force for change on the face of the earth. We have taken the life-giving, life-creating, life-nurturing systems of planet earth and pushed them into reverse. A number of scientists have determined that the risk of nasty shocks or sudden and abrupt climate catastrophes is increased if global average temperature goes up by two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial revolution temperature. We must embrace compassion, optimism, and faith. We must be mature, spiritual beings who can think beyond the end of our nose. The party is over. But if we are very lucky and very smart, we can rewrite Russell's history of the world to say that humanity rejected folly and that we returned to the garden. Excerpts from Can Civilization Survive Climate Change by Elizabeth May, leader of the Green Party of Canada, October 2006, Killam Lecture. So when he makes a car, he makes smog, he destroys Mother Earth, and it's only his vain belief that he's competent that makes him believe he's actually producing values. He's not. He's actually hurting people. So productivity, bad. Rationality, vain. Self-delusion, doesn't exist. I'm every bit as good as you are because you're no more competent than I am. Competency isn't possible, and your self-delusions of competency are destroying the Earth at my expense. You're driving through the Timmy's drive through Now, now there's, there's almost a Shakespearean tragedy in that, in the sense of a Shakespearean tragedy being self-induced. And that is that, you know, you wonder why someone would be motivated like that. You'd think even in the worst-case scenario, someone who was really greedy and wanted something for nothing would recognize that you don't kill the people who are creating the something that you want even to get your something for nothing, if you know what I mean. Right. And so is there, it's almost like there's some huge lack of knowledge. Well, they regard those things that, that people are actually out there and producing, they regard those things as stolen, pre-existing wealth. They confuse the man-made with the, with the natural and the given, right. and they say, you didn't really invent anything. Uh, you listen to people talk about, uh, you know, Bill Gates, for example. He didn't do anything to deserve his wealth. Well, of course he did. He doesn't deserve more than, he only worked so many hours a week. Why is he getting ten million dollars an hour? Well, because he has invented something that people value, other people. So their concept is that value isn't, men can't create values, it's just an illusion that when you make a car, you're creating, as I say, smog. You're, you're actually stealing value from nature. Right. And you're not really creating anything. And you're harming people. There's a net harm. And so what is right in the world is not thinking for yourself and producing, but rather being obedient to the will of Mother Nature being obedient to the needs 
that must be satisfied by Mother Nature of all humanity. And it's evil to de deny Mother Nature no. to each individual. They see sacrifices as, as a good, sacrifice for the other, and everybody getting an equal share of what Mother Earth provided, including rocket ships, computers, uh, babies, uh, you know, formula, and all these other things that ultimately they believe man didn't really produce, or at least no independent mind did. The whole collective did it. And so everybody's entitled to an equal share. And, and, and this self-delusion is only so that they can sleep at night knowing that they're stealing some guy's income and they didn't earn it. And they don't want to feel guilty about it, so they have to believe he didn't earn it. I, I wonder if everyone does feel that way, because I wonder if a lot of people even realize that's what they're doing. Again, I think it has to go deeper. But it, it gets to this point of suicide here. Like, I've got these two articles from the Post, one from Barbara, or, yeah, Barbara Kay, and I don't see the date on there. Here we are, April 8th. It says, Hug the Earth, Kill the Humans. And right. it's, a, it's about anti-natalists. And she says, they're gentler than Nazis. No ovens, just ideologically induce suicide. Yep. And then there's a National Post editorial from November 29th uh, called Taking Green to the Extreme. This is one of those things I clip and I go, is this for real, right? Uh, Tony Vernali, a dedicated British environmental crusader, apparently at 27 years old, she's now 35, had herself sterilized in order to, quote, protect the planet. And prior to that, she said she had an abortion rather than bring another consumer slash emitter into the world. I'm thinking, whoa, that's uh, that's pr pretty well bringing green to the extreme. Well, she might be right. I mean, she saved the world from another environmentalist. Well, maybe. But then again, <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, when I hear that the post response though was less than what I had hoped to hear because. Um, Listen to this argument. They say, we like to think, as most people do, that giving another person life and agreeing to raise them through infancy, childhood, and the teenage years into adulthood is the height of selflessness, not selfishness. And they're going far from being selfish. Uh, you know, we'd have no idea what it means, or he's, she says, Miss Vernelli has no idea what it means to make a sacrifice for others until they have children of their own. And here we go. With that's not a sacrifice at all. That's, that's, that's exactly what rubs me the wrong way. Sure. I mean, having children and raising them, that's, you're, you're actually producing what you need to preserve the things you value, the child and the child's admiration and love, and, and the things that bring you happiness. That's a productive, not a selfless effort, but a selfish effort. Mm -hmm. You don't want that child to go away. That child brings is a value to you, and you're earning that value on a constant basis. That's not a sacrifice at all, because you're getting something in return, and that's why you're doing it. Um, you know, if you think about this whole this whole uh, cult of zero worship, which is ultimately what it is, the belief that anyone who thinks they're above above zero is uh, is actually just deluding themselves, and they're the evil person. Right. They're the person who's stealing and making some people negative. You know, they literally believe that sadness comes from people producing that sadness comes because these rich people are stealing from people who otherwise wouldn't be poor these happy pe people are stealing from people who otherwise wouldn't be sad and that all we have to do is redistribute the wealth and everybody everybody will be at that ideal zero the average North American consumes five times more than a Mexican ten times more than a Chinese person and 30 times more than a person from India. We are the most voracious consumers in the world. A world that could die because of the way we North Americans live. Give it a rest. November 23 is Buy Nothing Day. Well, the problem with that is zero is non-productivity. Non-producing the things you need to live. Zero is death. And the cult of zero worship is ultimately that self-sacrificial cult of death. And that's a pretty heavy thing to say, but we have to take a break right now. And when we come back, we'll be talking about the footprint concept and what that means in practice when we actually see it. We'll be back right after these breaks. Difference. The planet is fine. Compared to the people, the planet is doing great. It's been here four and a half billion years. Did you ever think about the arithmetic? planet has been here four and a half billion years. We've been here, what, 100,000, maybe 200,000? And we've only been engaged in heavy industry for a little over 200 years. 200 years versus four and a half billion. And we have the conceit to think that somehow we're a threat? that somehow we're going to put in jeopardy this beautiful little blue-green ball that's just a floating around the sun? 
The planet has been through a lot worse than us. Been through all kinds of things worse than us. Been through earthquakes, volcanoes, plate tectonics, continental drift, solar flares, sunspots, magnetic storms, the magnetic reversal of the poles, hundreds of thousands of years of bombardment by comets and asteroids and meteors, worldwide floods, tidal waves, worldwide fires, erosion, cosmic rays, recurring ice ages, and we think some plastic bags <laughs> and some aluminum cans are going to make a difference? The planet... The planet. The planet isn't going anywhere. We are. We're going away.